Good morning, uh, one and all present here. We all have uh, gathered here for a uh, breakfast meeting on the subject landmark decisions in favor of assessees by uh, sorry uh, in income tax. And uh, to dwell upon this subject, we have C.A. Narendra Kumar Jain sir. I request uh, C.A. Shambhu Sharma, past chairman of Bangalore uh, Brand, uh, sir, to escort speaker on today's and then welcome him with a floral bouquet. Speaker, uh, C. Narendra Kumar J. Jain. Narendra Kumar is an advocate and is a commerce graduate and a fellow member of uh, Chartered Accountancy. He is also a Commerce Secretary and holds a Bachelor's Degree in Law. Narendra has experience over 19 years in advising clients in handling tax litigation in income tax, transfer pricing, corporate tax, international taxation, and GST. His academic distinctions include All India 5th rank in CS Intermediate, DL Majumdar's Silver Medal for securing highest marks in Advanced Companies Law and uh, Practice in CS Final, Taxman's Prize Award for securing highest marks in Direct, direct and Indirect Taxation Law and Practice in CS Final, Mrs. Pankajan Rangachari, <coughs> Rangachari SIRC Prize Award for securing highest marks in Advanced Company Law and Practice in CS Final. He has authored or co-authored uh, so many books. He has authored a book on uh, subject Analysis of Transfer Pricing Judgments published by CCH for two editions. He has co-authored a book on Digital Commerce and Analysis of Taxation Aspects and Emerging Issues published by IFA Bangalore Subchapter. Co-authored a book on Permanent Establishment Emerging Trends published by CTC and Tax Fund. He has co-authored another book on New Age Assessment, Penalties and Appeals, published by KSEA. He is a regular speaker at various conferences, workshops, study circles, NADT, etc. His teaching stints include teaching for CA final year students on direct taxes, indirect taxation, international taxation and transfer pricing from 2004 to 2018 and for CA final year students at ICA Bangalore chapter also. Narendra was convener of Bangalore subgroup, uh, subgroup of Chamber of Tax Consultants, Mumbai for 2019-20 uh, and uh, a treasurer of uh, International Fiscal Association, Bangalore subchapter from 2018 to 20. He is currently the Joint Secretary of Bangalore ITAT Bar Association. With this brief introduction, I present before you CA Narendra Kumar Jain. session. I thank you Bangalore branch for giving me this opportunity to share my views on certain recent Supreme Court decision in the income tax. Last two, three months, right from March onwards, we saw flurry of Supreme Court decisions in the context of income tax and indirect taxes also. Quite few decisions are authored by same bench, led by Mr. Amar Shah, Justice Amar Shah, who just retired. Some come up with interesting propositions of law. Some of these decisions, though, relate to many earlier assessment years, like one relates to assessment year prior to 89-90, assessment year 89-90. But they lay down certain very interesting principles. There are many decisions 
which need to be covered but given the time limitations and given the kind of decisions we have we we'll try and cover certain interesting decisions and we'll start with a decision which deals with black viscose mixture of hydrocarbons obtained manually or through distillation of petroleum which is bitumen it's rupees 5 per kg and the question is whether it is valuable very interesting decision in the case of dl singh versus cit this goes back to the assessment year 95 96 and it lays down some very interesting principles why because today the rate of tax gap so if it is a 69 e item for example if it is income item which falls in section 68 69 69 e etc we all know the tax rate stretches to 78% whereas if it is a normal business income the tax rate today is 30% or 25% has it may be applicable in a particular case now here there was a transport contractor and there was a scam the transport contractors work dl singh was in the business of transport contractor for almost 3 decades his work was to pick up bitumen from oil refineries and deliver it to the road transport department of bihar government in the process he delivered these goods there was a shortage in delivery the shortage in delivery was to the extent of 4443 metric tons in one year and 2094 metric tons in another year the income component of that or the value in terms of value was 2.19 crores in one of the years in 95 96 and in 96 97 it was 1.04 crores so it's a good sum of money even at that point of time the scam broke out there is information that these transporters are not delivering the bitumen which is lifted from oil refineries to the state road transport corporation the assessing officer notices this scam issues a 148 notice to the assessing for two assessment years 95 96 96 the assessing officer then issues notice to the engineers of road transport department issues notice to the assessee assessee claims that he has delivered the goods he gives delivery challenge that look i have delivered these goods these are the delivery challenges and these are counter signed by the so and so engineers the assessing officer summons the engineers junior engineer executive engineer in charge engineers of the state transport department except to all confirm that delivery has been done two officers two junior engineers say no no delivery has not been done and my signature are forged the assessing officer on that basis comes to a conclusion that this is income of the assessing the income was to the extent of short delivery multiplied by value which comes to 2 crores or plus 1 crore or in two of the years so he passes an assessment order interestingly he makes an addition under section 69 e of the act 69 e of the act says if the assessing officer if the assessee is found to be owner of any money bullion jewelry or other valuable article so assessing officer says whether this bitumen which is 5 rupees per kg multiplied by so and so quantum of bitumen which comes to 2 crores in one year and 1 crore in another year no doubt it is a valuable sum 2 crores and 1 crore so assessing officer makes an addition under section 69a of the act very interesting proposition that it is assessee is found to be owner of bitumen uh, sorry assessee is found to be owner of money bullion jewelry or any other valuable article and if he is so found to be owner and assessee does not have an explanation for that asset then it is deemed to be income of the such financial year these are the provisions of section 69 capital a so orders are passed the matter goes to the cit appeals cit appeals interestingly passes there were possibly two different cit appeals it's not coming out from the order but for one assessment year 
CI captain says, look, the assessing officer has not done proper inquiry. He should have seen whether the signature is forced. Then he should have asked a handwriting expert whether the signatures are really forced. The assessing officer should have given an opportunity to associate to cross-examine the junior engineers who are saying that delivery is done, not done. The people who have said the delivery is done is no problem because they are anyway talking in favor of the assessing. Only two guys gave against the assessing. For whatever reason, there may be some other reasons why it has been done. So CITFL says the assessing officer has not properly done the matter. For one assessment year, for 95-96, the CIT appeals set aside the order deleting, uh, set aside the order of the assessing officer, remanded back the matter to the assessing officer to verify, do cross examination, get an handwriting expert report, and see whether this is really delivery challenge or fault or not. We also don't know what really happened for that scam in terms of really, in terms of under the IPC and other things. That information I am not aware. What happened post remand we don't know. The assessing officer possibly might have accepted the and deleted the addition. For the second year, the CA appeal 96 97 confirms the addition. He says, No, no, this is a sufficient cause, you have not delivered the goods. There is a report of engineer in charge saying that you have not delivered the goods. Therefore, this is your income and he confirms the addition. Both the matters goes to the tribunal. Tribunal on the same day passes to different orders. You see how interesting the fact pattern is. On the same day, the tribunal passes the two different orders. As I said, in 95-96, the assessing officer, sorry, the CIT appeal said set aside the matter. Tribunal confirms that the set aside is okay and revenues appeal is dismissed. The 9697 which the uh, uh, had confirmed it, the assessor's appeal is dismissed. That means in one year, the addition set aside is said to be okay, second year addition is confirmed. So there is inconsistent order on the same day. The assessor files appeal to the High Court and assessor submits that, look, there is inconsistency in the tribunal orders. In one year you are saying so, one year you are saying so. Now High Court, on the merit part of it, holds that the transport concept contractor who did not deliver the consigned goods but received the full sale proceeds. He has received the full sale proceeds but not delivered the goods. And associates had possibly post that he must have sold those bitumen in the open market for XYZ value. We don't know what that value is. Has received the sale proceeds on behalf of the consigner, becomes the owner of the money because under 69A the test is you found to be owner of valuable article. Now you have to be owner to tax, tax it under 69. So because you have not delivered, you become owner of the goods. Okay. So this is one interesting legal proposition which Supreme Court deals with. Very interesting way of interpreting it. He is an owner of the goods for the purpose of section 69. And they discuss various decisions of what is owner. And High Court held anything that has value is valuable. Anything that has value is valuable and therefore it is valuable article and therefore taxable. The SSC files a review petition to the High Court saying that look there are contrary inconsistent decisions of the tribunal. In one year they have held so, year, second year you have held this. So you have not considered this aspect. The High Court says what the tribunal has done in other year is not our concern. What was before us was 96-97. 96-97 we have held this, this is the law. The matters travel to the Supreme Court. Now, Supreme Court, so as I said, they said everything which has a value is, is the value. The SSC made an alternate argument also that look, I have ultimately sold this at a later time and what I have sold is my income, not the value of bitumen, which market value on the date I have taken up. So there is a what the assessing officer has taxed is market value multiplied by the quantity. Okay, he said the assessing might have actually sold it at a lesser price. So if it is 5 rupees per kg, he might have sold it at 4 rupees per kg. Ultimately, item which is of theft will not sell it at the same value. The High Court rejected that argument and said that we have not given evidence that what value you have sold, therefore we will tax the value as considered by the assessing officer. Matter travels to the Supreme Court. <coughs> Two questions are there before the Supreme Court. Is the assessee owner and is bitumen valuable? 
and two interesting decisions. And the way the Supreme Court has dealt with these two decisions is what makes it very interesting. Now, can a person who is a carrier, who has taken these uh, goods, be the owner? So, Assassin's job was a transport contractor. It did not have a legal right in those goods. So, how do you interpret the word owner in the context of section 69A? Various dis arguments are made. Thus, the revenue also relies on section 110 of Evidence Act and a very landmark decision under 110 of Evidence Act, Churan Mal's case, Churu Mal's case. There, the customs authorities had made a raid at the premises of the assessee and found out valuable wristwatches in the bedroom of the assessee. The question was whether what is in the possession of the assessee, the assessee's owner. And the relying on 110 of the Evidence Act, 110 of Evidence Act says if you are in possession of a certain thing, you are deemed to be owner. The burden to prove that you are not the owner is on the person who is having the possession. So if I am having a possession of something, then I am the owner of this. Unless I demonstrate that it belongs to someone else, Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. X or Mr. Y. So that burden of proof is on the person who has in the possession. This is 110 of Evidence Act. And which is very common sense also and it is a common judicial, uh, common law judicial principle that the possession reflects the ownership. And this was applied in the context of Churumal's case and held that you are the owner of wristwatches in customs as well as income tax act and 110 of evidence act was principally applied for trade tax laws also. So here it was argued that Assas is owner of the bitumen, it is in his possession, therefore he is owner. That is the, one of the arguments. Supreme Court then discusses various other principles. If for example discuss Road Act of 20, 2007, it also discusses Carri Carriers Right, uh, Carriers Act of 1865. Now under these laws, what are the carriers right? So if it is in a possession of particular goods, these provisions, section 15 of Road Act 9, 9, uh, 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 2007 provides that if you are in possession, if the carrier is in possession of the goods and the person does not take a delivery, consignee does not take a delivery, then there is a time period given within which he can auction the goods. So if it is a perishable goods, he can do it with, after giving notice 24 months, uh, 24 day hours. If it is different kind of goods, 30 day notice can be given. So certain guidelines are given under the road act that what would be the carrier's responsibility of doing when he is not delivered a particular thing. Under that law, the person, if these conditions are satisfied, can do the auction of those goods, get the money, recover his right, but he has to still give the surplus back to the consignee or consignor, whatever the situation may be. So it discusses that. It discusses the sale of goods act, saying that for a legal transfer or legal right in the goods, the title to transfer, there has to be actual sale. It also discusses the contract act, the principle of bailment. So the carrier is a bailey. His, his right is only to take care of the goods from the place of pickup to the destination and he has to maintain a standard care. He cannot be negligent with the goods. He does not get a legal right over this. Then it interestingly also discusses various other principles and one from the uh, decision, one from the uh, Indian Penal Code that what is criminal breach of trust. And 428 of Indian Penal Code, there one of the examples given is if the carrier misappropriates the goods, has his own, then it's a criminal breach of trust. The Supreme Court asks a question, can a thief be a owner of goods? Can a thief be a owner of goods? Carrier is a shade better. In this particular case, the assassin is a shade better than thief because when he got the possession, he legally got the possession. That means he got the possession by virtue of specifically he be giving the goods. So he got that possession legally. But what he really did was a criminal breach of trust which is equivalent to what a thief would do. Only thing is thief would take the goods without legal owner, legal principle in getting involved. So can a thief be a owner of the goods? That was the question that Supreme Court had to answer. Now if they say that 
very interesting observation I've extracted that on the next slides. They said the thief cannot be a owner of goods. If you say that thief is owner of the goods, what happens about the real owner? How do you treat him? And it, it, when you apply this principle across other principles also, other situations also, how this would work. It also discusses Jodhmal Kutyal's case, which was with respect to understanding the word owner in the context of section 9 of 1922 act which is equivalent to section 22 of 1961 act what do you mean owner for the purpose of house property here the assessee was the assessee was in pakistan after partition the assessee had to move to india the property in pakistan were vested in custodian as per the of the pakistan assessee paid certain interest on those properties now, can you claim that interest as a deduction while calculating income from house property? The associate officer said that property is of Pakistan. Now, the custodian in Pakistan is owner of that property. You are no more a owner of the property. Therefore, you can't claim deduction for interest. You are no more a owner of the property. So, they disallowed that. Supreme Court said ownership means these four principles. If you see this second bullet points, power to enjoy and destroy the property right of possession for exclusion of others i should have a right to exclude others from entering my property power to eliminate intro virus or to charge a security power to give it through will or charge a security power to beat the property so these are the full rights associated with the ownership of property and someone to be an owner of the property whether in the context of 22 or whether in the context of 69 capital a should have these rights if someone does not have these rights, then he will not be taken as owner and he fought in the legal sense for the taxation purposes. So these principles Supreme Court called out from the Jodhmal Kutyal's case, Pudar Cement's case, Sahai Properties, Mysur Minerals case, which deals with depreciation. They said depreciation beneficial ownership is sufficient, legal registration is not required. So these principles they said, whether the contractor here can he be called as owner? A contractor is a bailey, not a owner. He got the possession, but he had certain responsibility. He does not have any ownership vested in him through a legal principles. Now, if you see the next slide, it says, look at these observations, very interesting observations. And this is one of very good decisions of recent time, especially the way it is written. The court is conscious of the fact that income derived from an illegal business can be legitimately brought to tax. However, that is far cry from justifying invocation of section 69A of the Act, as it is indispensable to invoke said section, said provision that the AO must find that article in question were under the ownership of the assessor in the financial year. This is apart from other requirements being met. So we know that illegal business is to be taxed, but at that at the same time, the provisions of 69A should be satisfied. There are two decisions in this particular decision, one by Justice Joseph and one by Justice Rishikesh Roy. Rishikesh Roy's decision, a small 19-page decision, I mean conquering decision, but also discusses the old principle from K. Pradi Syndicate's decision. It's a landmark decision, which talks is the first line of second thing. There is no equity about tax. So tax laws, when create a charge, has to be strictly read, and there is no equity about tax. Equally, a person cannot be taxed based on indentment. Unlike a possession of a person who for all intents and purposes in his own right earns income from house property, lawful otherwise, falls short of ownership only for want of formal convenience as required in section 54 of Transfer of Property Act, a carrier who clings to the possession not only without having a shadow of right, but what is more both contrary to contract as also to law cannot be found to be the owner. It would be straining the law beyond justification if the court were to recognize a thief as an owner of the property within the meaning of section 69a recognizing a thief as an owner of the property would also mean that owner of the property would sue is to be recognized as owner two persons cannot be owner so if you recognize thief as an owner the real owner cannot no more be a owner which would indeed be the most startling result so if I take thief as an owner for 69A, the real person who is the owner will no more be an owner. So that is most startling result. While possession of a person may in appropriate cases, this goes back to 110 of Evidence Act, while a possession of a person may in appropriate cases 
where there is no explanation forthcoming about the source and quality of his possession justify the EO finding him to be owner when the facts are known that a carrier is not the owner carrier is not the owner somebody else is the owner then to describe him as an owner may produce a result which are most illegal apart from being unjust so in a situation where the possession gives ownership rights but there is no other basis to say who have been real owner then it is fine to apply hand in ten of evidence act but in this case when everyone knows that carrier cannot be the owner because he has there is a way in which it has come to him therefore in this context saying that carrier will be owner will result in which, which will be unjust Though the assessee was in possession of bitumen, the right over the bitumen has an owner at no point of time could have been claimed by the appellant. The possession of the appellant at best is a shade better than that of a thief as a possession had its origin in the contract of bailment. So his possession is better than, a shade better than that of a thief. So they said assessee is not a owner. In a legal sense, assessee is not a owner. Then they went on to discuss what do you mean by valuable. Valuable. When do you say that it is valuable? As I said, the words in 69 capital A says money, bullion, jewelry, or other valuable article. The first three words clearly signify something which is valuable. And the word has to be interpreted either applying principles of Azutin generis, where you see that there is a specific elaboration and then a generic elaboration. And that generic term or generic word has to take its meaning from the specific words. Or the word has to be judged by the company it keeps. The word has to be judged by the company it keeps. The associate argued, the associate argued that the appellant principle of resulting generous vitamin would stand out as a strange bedfellow in the company of immediate predecessor words. Money, bullion, jewelry and bitumen. How does it look? It doesn't look good. If you read 69A has money, bullion, jewelry and other bitu and bitumen. So Asasi said it is a strange bedfellow to money, bullion and jewelry and therefore it cannot be a valuable article. Bitumen is a clear misfit. It could not have been legislative intention to treat bitumen as other valuable article. So the, the, the Supreme Court goes into history of 69A which was inserted in 1965 the memorandum, the circular explaining the provision, all always said that these are similar items, money, bullion, jewelry is what has to be brought into this section 69A. And it never dealt with normal items like a sack of rice or cement or bitumen in this particular case. That was never the intention to bring such items within its classification. Supreme Court discusses various examples. It says, for example, whether mobile could be valuable article. So if it's a mobile of 2 lakh rupees, possibly it's a valuable item. Can a tender coconut, 10,000 tender coconuts, though value-wise it will be huge, but whether it can be valuable article? They say it cannot be a valuable article. So what principle they bring out is that valuable means whether large quantity of a small value, in this particular place the quantity is huge, the value per quantity is less, or small quantity with higher value. So they say it should be a valuable article, it should have a good price great deal of money good price great deal of money so it has to be something which is valuable that means a small quantity with a higher price and not with a large quantity with a smaller price so that is a principle laid down in this it is possibly helpful because you see the current situation when they come for a survey they will say stock 69a 78 percent straight away 78 percent is applied in case of a search or surveys if a stock is found excess or for whatever things. So in these cases, that may be business income. It will be taxable as business income, but it will be taxable at normal slab rate. It cannot be applied 78% under 115 BBE, which is the current practice from the department, saying that everything, so excess stock of a, suppose you go to a Kirana shop and found out an excess stock. If for example, the decision of Chhattisgarh High Court in Danush case, Kirana shop, stock excess, they said 115 BBE is applicable, you have to pay 78%. Supreme Court said how can, sorry, High Court said how can Kirana items be valuable article. It will not fall in 69A. It is taxable as normal business income. You can't apply the, you cannot apply the provisions of section 69A. So those, in that context only we will have to see that small quantity 
of large value is what will be classified as valuable, not the large quantity of a small value. That cannot be classified as uh, uh, valuable. Very interesting observations here also. It says, if all sundry articles of nominal value are bracketed in the category of valuable article, it will lead to an absurdity and will also be inconsistent with the legislative intent. intent. Focusing on the high value total, high total value of an article, ignoring its lowly per unit price would mean including low cost ordinary articles also in the valuable category under section 69. This would defy the legislature's logic. In this context, when the principle of assuming generous is applied, the preceding words in section 69A such as money, bullion and jewellery would suggest that the phrase other valuable article which follows these words would justify inclusion of only high value goods. Notably, in, it can be seen that article of a value are a genus of which valuable article are a species, a subset of high priced items. To put it different, differently, an article having value may not be valuable article. This is what the High Court had held, that anything that has value is valuable. The High Court had held anything that has value is valuable. As for instance, a bag of cement, a sack of rice, a diamond stone will certainly have some value, but only the diamond stone can be regarded as a high cost valuable item. To categorize all sundry items as valuable article will mean an interpretation which will, which will be foreign to the purpose of law and intention of legislature, so far as section 69A is concerned. It also quotes one of the songs uh, from first hello and last goodbye and say if gold would be precious if we all, gold would not be precious if we all had to spare. So if everyone had a gold, it would not be precious. If we have, everyone had a gold to spare, then even gold would not be precious and concludes the decision saying that it is not valuable. So what we draw from this decision is the ownership test and principle laid down on the ownership test. That how do we interpret these principles? That four tests the Supreme Court gives after extensive discussion of various decisions. What is valuable? Small quantity, high price, good deal of money can be valuable. Department's approach of bringing everything into 68, not 68, rather 69, 69A, 69B may not be correct in these cases. <coughs> Only items which fall, which are similar to gold, money, gold, bullion, jewellery is something which can be brought into this particular provision. One would wonder, and the additions were deleted by the Supreme Court. One would wonder why the assessing officer taxed it at 69A. If you would have just said that it is business income, all this, I mean, we would not be discussing this interesting decision today. But if that was a simple way of possibly taxing it, saying that it is arising of the business, or tax it under any other thing, bringing it at 69, the department really lost out in this case because the test of ownership, the thief cannot be an owner was what the Supreme Court said and valuable, bitumen cannot be valuable is what the Supreme Court said. These are possibly take away from this uh, decision of B.N. Singh's uh, case. Then we will discuss another case of Mansarovar commercial. they should have ideally taxed what money he got from sale of bitumen because that was his additional income. That would have been the right approach for department to adopt. If they would have taxed that, that is an illegal income that he got. So that would have been the most, most in my opinion, that would have been the most appropriate way for them to tax it. But they went ahead and taxed the bitumen easy way, quantity multiplied by value and to be taxed. You know, the little more effort required to say that how ultimately this bitumen was dealt with by the assessing. We sold it in the open market, which is very clear, because otherwise what would we do with such a large quantity of bitumen? So the right thing would have been because that is what he really got. That is what is really his income. That is what he comes to him. The money, what is subsequently realized from sale of bitumen. 
and that would have been taxed it would have been more easier for the revenue to tax that income but somewhere they possibly missed the bus and they taxed it under 69a and we get this decision in terms of 69a isn't it a wrong precedent because somebody who has to pay a tax has gone tax free now do we always judge the tax laws with the intent which is the second decision if you see second and third decisions we will see this we do show always go by the intent to tax something which is taxable or should we follow what is given in the statute that is where this decision of cape brand is syndicate justice rowlett's decision there is no equity about tax it has to be read in nothing extra can be read in nothing can be taken away from this these observations are there these are classic observation by justice rowlett in cape brand is syndicate supreme court the mind the justice rishikesh roy's decisions discusses this particular decision and quotes this particular paragraph from that decision and then concludes that this is how we are reading it 69a r has to be strictly interpreted because they are a provision which try to strictly enforce a tax liability when you do a strict interpretation literal interpretation strict interpretation of the statutes the test of ownership is not satisfied the revenue making mistake and not taxing it under other provision would not make the situation here different here if it was other way around for example in a provision exemption provision you make a small mistake and the exemption is denied that's what supreme court had recently said right the exemption notification has to be strictly read so this is the other extreme of that that a taxing charging section has to be strictly interpreted and if you do not fall within the ambit of that taxing statute then it has to be given so if there is a no legal purchase made by a person can the same be regarded as business income no if it is in the course of business in this particular case or in any other cases so i mean you are saying that if you have not done legal purchase in sense there is a theft of goods yeah. so it may not if it, it may not be business income but it can surely fall in the other income it can surely fall in the other income <coughs> now in this case what would have possibly happened for example if they tax the subsequent sale as income whether in other income or wherever and subsequently the assessee had to pay this money back to the government whether that would be deductible expenditure that would not be a deductible expenditure because that is for an illegal act and 37 would restrict it so he would ultimately tax if it was rightly taxed next decision mansour over commercial these are this is a decision of a bad facts through and through bad facts some of us see succeeded in between but ultimately lost the facts are so bad that anyone reading this decision would get a feeling to isko the tax lagna hi chahiye tha sikkim became part of india in 1975 up to 31st march 89 there was no tax indian tax in sikkim so there was a sikkim income tax manual under which the sikk tax was levied in sikkim for roughly 14 years very little tax under that manual some 2% 3% some 3 rupees of 1000 for agriculture produce so such was the tax in that there are group of five companies in this which were all registered in sikkim these companies were registered in sikkim they were commercial agent for cardamom and other agriculture products so they were claiming that we are having operations in sikkim no operations in india so we refer india and sikkim is sikkim is part of india but for the purpose of this decision we refer india and sikkim so we have no operations in india therefore no liability to pay tax in india we have paid tax in sikkim and no double taxation it cannot be taxed in india there was search conducted at a chartered accountant's premises ratan gupta and company in delhi in his premises various documents were uh, uh, seized related to these companies there were i think five to six companies books of accounts check books blank signed checks vouchers other income document of the assc companies were found at his premises also blank letter heads signed letter heads and various other documents were 
found at his premises. During the search, it was also analyzed that the relatives of this particular chartered account were all directors in those companies. The directors made a statement, so one Mr. Rajiv Chain made a statement saying that I became director because the CA told me to become director. The companies had in invested in Dalmia group of companies. The money which the, these companies had were invested in Dalmia group of companies, all based in Delhi. All income was agents who were giving this income. So it was getting a commission income in Sikkim for sale of uh, agriculture products. So it is getting this commission age income. These agents were all outside Sikkim. The SSC could not produce any of these agents before the assessing officer. The notices were issued, the summons were issued by the assessing officer to those agents who gave the commission, but they were not appearing before the assessing officer. There was also some sort of a money trail, money going from Delhi to Sikkim and coming back to Delhi. Supreme Court also observes that the amount of commission income declared is more than the product, production of cardamom in the Sikkim or that could be possible in the state of Sikkim. So that kind of a bad fact it is. <coughs> Assessing officer issues notice under 148 after the search to this Mr. Ratan Gupta. Ratan Gupta says I will not take the notice. They affix the notice at his premises. Now, is it a valid service of notice is one of the issues. Against the notice, the assessees file a writ petition in Sikkim. First writ petition in Sikkim. See how the case goes on. They file a writ petition in Sikkim. Sikkim High Court first entertains the writ, gives a stay, but later on realize that cause of action is in Delhi. How can Sikkim jurisdiction be used for High Court writ? So they dismiss the writ petition. Assessee files a writ in Delhi saying that assessing officer has no jurisdiction. I am all companies based in Sikkim. I am having operations in Sikkim. How can an assessing officer in Delhi issue me a notice? So these notices are invalid. They get a stay matter drags on. It drags on up to 98. These are assessment year 89, 90. And another fact is, once the income tax law applied to Sikkim, these company had no income. So, then the Delhi High Court in 98 said let the assessment be framed, assessment was framed, writs were withdrawn, appeal was filed to CA Temples. What the assessing officer held is that the control and management of these companies is with Mr. Ratan Gupta. These companies are resident in India by virtue of section 363 of the Income Tax Act. The control and management wholly being situated in India, these companies are resident in India and this income is taxable in India. Very nice argument from the revenue basically that they are these companies, he didn't say that this income is occurring in India, he said that these companies control and management itself is in India and they become resident in India then their global income is taxable. And he said there is no resident director in Sikkim, no board meetings are held in Sikkim, therefore entire control and management is with this Mr. Ratan Gupta and it is taxable in Delhi and therefore I have a jurisdiction to assess this income. CIT appeals confirms this and matter travels to the tribunal. Before the tribunal, Assessi argues that service of notice on Ratan Gupta is bad in law. Ratan Gupta is not a principal officer under section 2 subsection 35 clause B of the act. 235B says person who is involved in regular management can be treated as principal officer, but to treat him as a principal officer, the assessing officer should have issued a notice with an intent to treat him as a principal officer. Now here the assessing officer did not issue any notice treating him as a principal officer. The tribunal had held that since the notice serving served is bad in law, the assessments are bad in law. Saying that he cannot be principal officer under 235, the Ratan Gupta had never accepted the notice, notices were fixed on his premises and though he has cooperated in the assessment proceedings but he is not a principal officer under 235 therefore service of notice is bad in law. The matter travels to the Delhi High Court. Delhi High Court on all counts holds in favour of revenue saying that the Ratan Gupta service of notice on Ratan Gupta is correct. There is no problem with that service of notice. The, they basically rely on the civil procedure code and say that 
because he is involved in control and management, he is not accepting the notice, he is deemed service of notice under 120, rule 120, order 5, civil procedure code. And they held the service of notice is bad. With respect to second argument on jurisdiction, they reject SSS argument and they uphold that control and management of these companies is situated in India and therefore entire income is taxable in India. So naturally, <coughs> the matter travels to the uh, Supreme Court. SSC files these petitions to the Supreme Court and before the Supreme Court, SSC argues that multiple arguments SSC is taking before the Supreme Court. One, he is not a principal officer under 235, therefore, to subsection 35, therefore, service of notice is invalid. How can a jurisdiction of the officer be in Delhi when the companies are in Sikkim? If the officer in Delhi thought that there is a valid case, he should have passed a transfer order 127, transferred the cases to Sikkim, and officer in Sikkim should have dealt with these particular companies and assessment of those companies. Third, they said that the the books of accounts and other things. There is a statement made that these have been given to the chartered accountant for the purpose of audit and the books were with him for the purpose of audit. And no more. The control and management was with the directors in Sikkim. However, they have not produced any other further records to demonstrate that the directors were actually holding board meetings. Those evidences are not forthcoming. So what Supreme Court observes that on the factual part, there is no strong rebuttal by the SSC on the factual part that there is no confirmation from any of the agents that they have really given the commission. The money trail, money moving from Delhi to Sikkim and back to Delhi. On the part that there is no employees in Sikkim, there is no major expense in Sikkim. So those go to demonstrate that there was no really any activity in Sikkim. So Supreme Court said that applying principles, they discuss various decisions of 6.3 both under the 1922 Act and subsequent to that. Because 1922 Act had this problem of residency because there was British India and India and the Act applied only to British India. So those could be circumstances under which the company can be resident in British India or other state. So applying those decisions, they come back to the old principle of de facto control. The standard understood principles in the six context of section 3, 3, uh, 6 3 that it is not de jure control but de facto con control and power actually exercised in the course of conduct and management of the affairs of the firm. That who is actually taking decisions on the conduct and management of the firms. The registration domicile of the company is not relevant for the purpose of 6 3, Supreme Court concluded, and they said that de facto control is what needs to be seen. They said Ratan Gupta is not merely rendering professional services. The argument that he is only rendering audit services, the books of accounts were with him for the purpose of audit. Those arguments were rejected by the Supreme Court and they said he is vital say in control and management and he, in fact he is a control and management affairs of the respective associate. And therefore they upheld the Delhi High Court decision saying that control and management of this company is situated in Delhi and therefore applying the principles of applying the rules 6.3 the company becomes resident in India and entire, entire income is taxable in India. The With respect to service they also upheld the Supreme Court, the High Court's view saying that the service was rightly done. So but the Supreme Court's decision does not discuss the principles laid down under 235b. So 235B says if you want to treat someone as a principal officer, you need to issue a notice to him to treat him as a principal officer. That aspect Supreme Court decision is not discussing, but somehow they concluded what the High Court had, High Court had held <coughs> relying on the uh, CPC provisions and said that it is a valid service of notice. They said the income, because there is no evidence that the activity has undertaken in Sikkim. The income accrues and arises in India and therefore it is taxable in India and it is not taxable in Sikkim. The associate made an argument that look there is double taxation. I have paid it in Sikkim and I have also have to pay it in India. The associate relied on the earlier decision of Mahavid Jain's case. It was in the contest of Sikkim lottery. As we all know there was Sikkim lottery which was very famous earlier. So associate resident of Rajasthan had earned 20 lakh rupees in Sikkim by Sikkim lottery. The SSC claimed that it is not taxable in India. The Supreme Court in that decision had held that it is taxable in Sikkim, not taxable in India. Though not very sound decision because the SSC there was resident in India. 
resident and ordinary resident in India and these global incomes would have been taxable. But still Supreme Court said that income is taxable only in Sikkim, not taxable in India. Associate relied on that decision to say that income is taxable in only in Sikkim. I am paying income tax in Sikkim. The income tax authorities in Sikkim have accepted it. Therefore, there cannot be any taxability in India. The Supreme Court rejected that argument on the ground that the SSC has not produced any evidence to really demonstrate that income accrued in Sikkim. The activities have not really taken any, there are no employees and expenses in Sikkim. Therefore, any activity is not undertaken in Sikkim. Therefore, you cannot say that income has accrued in Sikkim, but it has accrued outside Sikkim, possibly in Delhi, and therefore it is taxable in India. So, based on all materials, they said that SSC cannot it cannot be said that it is taxable only in Sikkim and taxability in India was upheld. Taxability in India was upheld. So this is an interesting decision. In today's context, the principles laid down under 6.3 are very relevant, but the provisions of 6.3 have changed. Now we have moved to POEM. The control and management aspect for other partnership firms and all those may be relevant. But in the context of company, today we have moved to POEM, where the board has given elaborate guidelines that how you will determine a poem. This situation can arise today also, but only because the provision of changes, otherwise this decision would have been very relevant. For example, lot of Indian companies will have subsidiaries outside India, where most of the decisions may be taken in India. And there would be a risk that they would be treated as control and management situated in India and those companies income. Suppose I have a subsidiary in Singapore. And all these activities related to decision making of those companies if are taken in India then there would be risk that those companies could be treated as resident in India applying the principle laid down in this particular decision. However, because the poem has come into this, we will have to go by the principle laid down in the circular which deals with the poem. They say what is active business, what is passive business, what is the nature of income, whether it is passive income like royalty, interest, dividends and based on that what is the classification. If it is into active business, whether employees are in India or outside India, assets are in India or outside India, then they have a 50 crore threshold for the purpose of uh, taxability, for the purpose of applying POEM. So keeping that in context, one will have to still apply the principles laid down in, in the context of POEM when you have a subsidiaries outside India. The decision highlights that bad facts, as in this particular case, a bad planning and bad facts can lead to taxability, maybe after three decades, but it can result in a tax consequences. Next, we will deal with a very. That's why we gave this from lottery income only. Hmm? Lottery income only the same as there, no? Tax only in what? Sikkim only, not in. Yeah. What are the rest of them? They, they have said it is taxable in Sikkim, it is taxes paid in Sikkim. 20 lakhs was the lottery income, 1 lakh odd was tax paid in Sikkim. It lead to double taxation if it is paid in India. And on that basis, they said it is not taxable. So that may be not be sound rational, but that was the decision of the Supreme Court. Next, we come to a decision on retrospectivity of law. Retrospectivity of machinery provision. When will a machinery provision be retrospective and how to apply this? This decision to some extent creates problem because Vatika Township had very clearly said that if a new liability is created then that provision cannot be retrospective. It is a five bench decision of Supreme Court. It was also in the context of search. This 153C also is in the context of search. Uh, sorry, Vikram Sujit Kumar Bhatia says, Vikram Bhatia's case is also in the context of search. Now, as we all know, the provisions related to search, 153A and 153C, no doubt the changes coming from 21, this becomes comes under 147, but at least for the earlier years, in the context of 153A and 153C. 153A provided that the income of the searched person has to be reassessed for 6 years and the provision related to that were contained in 153 capital A. So pending assessments abate, all those provisions are contained in section 153 capital A. 153C dealt with a situation where there is another person, person who has not been searched but certain information material related to that person has been found during the course of a search in the searched person premises. Now, how do you assess that other person? 
that other person was dealt in 153C. Now 153C was amended in 16 from birth defect from 16 2015. There are two provisions which I have highlighted old provision and new provision. It is a small change, but that makes a large difference. If you see the first on the left hand side, it says notwithstanding so and so. If the assessing officer is satisfied that any money, bullion, jewelry, other valuable article or thing, or books of accounts or documents seized or requisition belongs or belongs to a person other than a person referred in 153A. So I do a search at the premises of Mr. A. You found out money, bullion, jewelry, etc., which belong to some third party or a third person. Then, with respect to that third person, the assessing officer can issue notice after recording the satisfaction that he wants to issue notice for that person. He will issue notice for six years for that. Now, the change which was made in is on the right side. So, notwithstanding so and so, if the assessing officer is satisfied that any money, bullion, jewelry, or other valuable article or thing seized or requisitioned belongs to. So when it comes to money, bullion, the belongs to word is still retained. When it comes to books of accounts documents, the belongs to gets trans substituted by pertains to or pertain or relates to, pertains slash relate. How it makes a difference is, for example, this particular case. A search was conducted at one particular group of companies and in that search, a hard disk was found. In the hard disk, an Excel data was found that this associate Vikram Bhatia has given so and so money in cash. Now, if it was old provision, what would have happened? And if it is a new provision, what would have happened? If it is an old provision, does the hard disk belong to the associate? <coughs> hard disk belongs to the person search. It doesn't belong to the Vikram Bhatia or the Assassi in this case. It doesn't belong to other person. It belongs to the person searched. So if I have to apply the test on the left side, can you say hard disk belong to him? No. Can I say the data in that hard disk in the Excel format belong to him? Or it only pertains to him? It cannot belong to him. The Excel file in that hard disk cannot belong to him. This is a very interesting decision of Delhi High Court, PepsiCo Holdings case, which result, which was the reason for this amendment. A search was conducted, a sale deed was found. Now, sale deed was found in the premises of a searched person. Can it belong to other person? It cannot belong to other person. It is he searched it. It can relate or pertain to other person. It can give you some information that relates or pertain to other person, but it cannot belong to that other person. The Delhi High Court held that it cannot belong to him. Your 153 notice is invalid. Okay. Now, so they made this amendment and said that belongs to is replaced by the provision was substituted and belongs to is replaced by pertains or relates to. Uh, this amendment was with effect from 16 2015. This amendment was with effect from 16 2015. And this created a situation where the scope gets enlarged. The scope gets enlarged. See if you see these dates. The search is before the date of amendment. The search is in 4-9-2013. Panchnama is drawn in 2013. The assessee the went to the settlement. The person who was searched went to the settlement commission and his settlement application is on 2015. The documents were transferred. Because of settlement commission, they got additional time and the documents were transferred to the assessing officer of the assessee in 2017 and notice was issued in 2018. So the last two dates are after the amendment. The search is before the amendment. The question is, an amendment which has been made, a machinery provision for issue of notice, whether it should be applicable from the date of search. That means whether any search which has been done before the amendment will not be covered under the new provision. The assessor's argument was simple. That would be applicable for searches conducted prior to. That means the right side provision will be applicable to searches conducted prior to 16-2015. And searches conducted after 16-2015, only the new provision will be applicable. The old provisions will be applicable only for searches conducted prior to 16-2015. The new provision cannot be applied to searches conducted prior to 16-2015. And that is very logical because in search provisions, if you see, everything is linked to the date of search, initiation of search and panchnama. 
your time limits, your all amendments have always been linked to the date of search. For example, you see the recent amendment also, they said search is happening before 31 3 2021, the old provision will apply, post and new provision will be applicable. So the SSC said the new provision is enlarging the scope, it is bringing into its ambit new assesses. So it is prospective in nature and searches post 1 6 2015 only should be considered. The revenues argument is that look, any notice which has not been issued, any notice which is issued after 1 6 2015, whether it relates to earlier search or earlier assessment, it does not matter. It is retrospective in nature. 153C new army provision should be applicable. So their argument was the date of issue of notice, new provisions were in force, and therefore the new provision should be applicable. And because it has enhanced the scope, because in this case you can clearly see. If you apply the old provision, he is out, the SSC is out. And if you apply the new provision, he is liable for 153C. Because what was found is a hard disk in which the Excel said that so and so cash has been received. So this cannot belong to him, it can relate to him, it can pertain to him. So these were the phases of interpretation which was relevant here. The Supreme Court, <coughs> the Gujarat High Court, in a batch of cases, these all cases emanate from Gujarat High Court's decision, mostly from Gujarat High Court's decision. The Gujarat High Court had said that amendment is prospective and only applicable for searches done before, after 1 6 2015. It does not apply to searches done prior to 1 6 2015. This is now reversed by the Supreme Court. And the way Supreme Court reversed is directly contrary to what we discussed in the first decision. First decision went by the language words and this decision clearly goes by intent so two contrary decisions of supreme court one clearly focusing on the language what is stated and what is literal interpretation this goes on the intent it gives up various aspects and various justifications why these notices were valid it said that the pepsico's decision gave a very narrow interpretation to what belongs to now, if you see the word belongs to, just if PepsiCo's decision was right, because a sale deed found in the premises of a search person cannot belong to other person. It was very, very easy and very correct decision. That's why the word used. There's no other choice apart from interpreting it in that way. But anyway, the Supreme Court said that the PepsiCo's decision was very narrow interpretation and it came in the way of suppressing the very mischief the legislature intended to suppress. The legislature intended to suppress the mischief with the amendment saying that what other person we want to tax him also. And that mischief, PepsiCo's decision came in a way. Therefore, PepsiCo's decision is not correct. Second, they say when a provision is substituted, this is an important thing because many times an entire substitution of section happens. Now, they say when a provision is substituted, relying on the decision of Shamra Parulkar's case, the old provision is wiped out. It is taken to be as if never in existence. And the new provision is what in existence always. So whenever this substitution happens, the Supreme Court said that old provision is wiped out. It is never in existence. And only the new provision is in place. So effectively they said this provision, when the section was inserted, it is in place from there. So this is a very wide ambit because many a time substitution happens in the act. To say that every time the substitution provision will wipe out the old provision, and it will apply for all preceding years. It's a very wide interpretation that the Supreme Court has given. Especially when many times you will see the memorandum very clearly saying that section is applicable from so and so date. Here also, when the amendment was made, the provision, the memorandum said it is applicable from 1 6 2015. It never said it applies to earlier things. Then the Supreme Court said the last uh, bullet here. The primary and foremost task of a court in interpreting a statute is to ascertain the intention of legislature. So its task is to attain, attain, ascertain the intention of legislature, actual or imputed, and to ascertain the legislative intent is the basic rule of statutory construction and that rule of construction should be preferred which advances the purpose and object of legislation and that though the construction according to the plain language should ordinarily be adopted, such a construction should not be adopted when it leads to anomalies, injustice, absurdities. So go by the intent. Go by the intent. Don't go by literal language. Is what the Supreme Court tries to lay down its decision. Whether they will go by the intent when there is an exemption provision also. 
whether they will go by intent when there is a beneficial provision also whether they will give that much of leeway when it comes to beneficial provisions exemption provisions the courts are today taking that they should be strictly interpreted and when it comes to these kind of provisions which create charge or create a new liability they say they should be interpreted with the intent so is the wind moving only in favor of revenue so this is where the the contrast of first decision and this decision comes where they strictly interpreted the language what is owner what is valuable and here they didn't go by exact wordings they went by what was the intent and intent was to catch these third parties against whom there is an incriminating material available the assessee says if the assessee submissions at section 153 proceedings cannot be conducted in cases where search is conducted prior to so and so despite having incriminating material against the persons other than search is accepted then the object and purpose of 153 shall be frustrated so if the assessee's argument is accepted then the object and purpose of 153c will be frustrated and therefore giving the object and purpose of the statute the taxation should be done and the assessee's this amendment should also apply to the searches done prior to 16 2015 so this is a they said machinery provision should always be construed to effectuate the object third bullet object and purpose of the statute and not defeat the c what happens is lot of these amendments come into picture gradually you will see that for example take a recent last year's amendment to 149 the scope of issue of notice under 149 beyond 3 years has been expanded when the first provision was brought in 149 said that you can go for 3 years but you can go to 3 years to 10 years if the income escaping assessment income chargeable to tax which is escaped assessment is more than 50 lakhs and it is represented in the form of an asset now in 22 they enlarged that scope and added two more line items expenditure and an entry in the books of accounts which is bogus now the memorandum very clearly says this applies from assessment year 22 23 the assessing officer is going to say that look supreme court has said any notice i issued after 1 422 this is a machinery provision this is issue of notice it's a machinery provision it will also encompass situation where expenditure is more than 50 lakh or there is an entry in books of account which they reflects an income component which is more than 50 lakh rupees so for example recently we had a case where a share premium of earlier years of 17 18 they issued a notice it is share premium more than 50 lakh rupees was not assessed in the original assessment therefore we are issuing notice now now if you go by the old provisions it has to be represented by an asset share premium is not an asset so the scope if we apply machinery provision the way supreme court interpreted in vikram bhatia's case there will be situations where the scope of issue of notice is enlarged in subsequent amendments also the authorities are going to take a view that from the date of amendment any notice issued even to prior assessment years will be covered and therefore they are valid in issuing notice this is where this decision will create problems this decision goes back and settled principles of the vatika township that when you are enlarging the scope the charge where you are bringing in new assessees within the tax net because here clearly new set of assessees came within the tax net by the amendment which was made in 153c those assessees were not taxable based on the old provision they become taxable based on the amendment and if a such an amendment is taken to be retrospective it will create hardship for the assessee but anyways that is how the decision is and this is what the supreme court held and what is what we have to be aware of next we'll go to an interesting decision in the context of transfer pricing in international tax okay so suppose the search is conducted on the premises of mr x in connection with search on some other person And in the premises of X, they find uh, uh, documents pertaining to X only. So in that case, whether assessment under one fifty three C can be proceeded. In my opinion, in these cases, now what is asking is there is a search. Mr. A is the main party. The search warrant will be on Mr. A, and he search warrant other premises also will be covered. So it covers premises of Mr. B also. Though the warrant main warrant is in the name of A. premises of mr b is also covered mr b in his premises they found out documents information etc related to mr b itself 
So for Mr. B, who is a searched party, whether assessment should be done under 153 capital A or 153 C, right, sir? This is the question. Now, if you see the revenue, they have been doing assessment of these cases in 153 C. In my opinion, ideally these cases, the search is at the premises of the assessing. So assessment should be done in 153 A. There are a couple of reasons why I will state for that. One, 153A or C does not link to warrant or does not say that based on warrant the person is either 153A or 153C. The classification is based on documents etc. related to pertaining to the classification between A is searched person and if the information is available with respect to person is related to pertains to. One. Second, if you see the date of abatement of search, 153A says, proviso, second proviso to 153A says, that all pending assessment shall abate on the date of initiation of search. When it comes to 153C, first proviso to 153C would say that it will abate, the pending assessments will be abate when the information is received by the assessing officer of the search person. So if you take this example only, in case of a searched person, the abatement, the trigger point of abatement is first date, 4 9 2013. First, first date is 4 9 2013. In case of a 153C person, the date of abatement is 25-4-2017. This is the date when the assessing officer of the other person received money bullion, etc. So first proviso to 153C would say that the date of abatement will be, the, for the purpose of abatement, the date when the assessing officer of the other person receives the information, that will be the date of abatement. So this classification is made, the distinction is made in first proviso to 153CA. Now, how will this particular thing work if you do the assessment of a searched person in 153C? It will not work. So, the date of abatement will have to relate back to the date of search in case of other person also. So, therefore, in my opinion, it should be 153A, but it's a grey area. The venue has been doing an assessment under 153C for such persons also. But 153 also should not be valid because he is not a search party. He is not search or not See, if you see search, if you see 153A, it doesn't link to warrant. It says whose premises have been searched. It doesn't say that warrant should be in his name. Nowhere 153A says that. It says if it is searched, then you do a 132 search has been conducted, you do it. So that is the place point of argument that warrant is there, so it should be there. But 153C also will not be valid in such cases. So both the provisions should fail. Anyway, that problem will not be going forward at least because now 147 will have to be done in those cases because of the amendment by 2021 finance act. Now we come to the two, three important interesting decisions with respect to transfer pricing and international taxation. First we will try and see the Kanata <coughs> report in software and quickly run through it. Then we will go to the SAP Labs decisions, SAP Labs decision, then e-value serve and travel port. These decisions, as we know that the question of law, substantial question of law before the Supreme, uh, before the High Court in Section 260 Capital A, in the context of transfer pricing, in the context of transfer pricing, what could be a substantial question of law? The Karnataka High Court gave finding in the question of soft primes, a very restrictive finding in the question of, in the context of uh, transfer pricing, saying that in what context the substantial question of law would arise. The issue before the Karnataka High Court was exclusion of four comparables. That four companies which are not comparable, how do you apply that? Exclusion of four companies was there. And the RPT filter of 15%. So comparable and filter is what was before the Karnataka High Court. Before Karnataka High Court, if you see the law, legal principles laid down before Karnataka High Court's decision, Chunilal Maita, Hiro Vinod's case, all these decisions very said that for it should be a substantial question of law, Vijay Talwar's case, that finding of a fact, if the finding is perverse, then it can lead to a substantial question of a law. The Karnataka High Court's decision in Microlabs case says that when do you say a finding of a fact is perverse? It says tribunal decides the matter by admitting irrelevant evidence. So it decides on the basis of irrelevant evidence. It is a perverse finding. It ignores relevant evidence. It is a perverse finding. And when there is no evidence, but it gives a decision, then it is a perverse finding. 
So irrelevant evidence taken into consideration, relevant evidence ignored and no evidence but decision given. So then it can lead to perversity. Before Karnataka High Court in micro labs case the issue was provision of warranty. Whether there is a scientific basis of doing a provision of warranty based on Supreme Court decision in road track controls. The High Court found that there is no evidence on what basis this provision has been made and how did the tribunal come to the conclusion that it is a scientific finding. Therefore, the finding is perverse and substantial question of law arises. In the TP context also, similar situations may arise whether the tribunal's finding is perverse or not. TP is generally a factual exercise, so therefore this issue is more in the context of transfer pricing that whether the finding will be perverse or not. So the Supreme, uh, sorry, Karnataka High Court team, uh, soft friends laid down certain principles. What it laid down? The existence of substantial question of law is an indispensable requirement for maintaining an appeal before the High Court. The entry in, into the High Court under 260A of the Act is locked with the words substantial question of law. Central principles. The key to open the law to maintain such appeal can only be perversity in the finding of tribunal in these type of cases and perversity in the finding should be established on the basis of cogent material which are available before authorities include below including the tribunal. No problem till now that it should be it should be substantial question of law then only 260A come into picture the tribunal finding should be established based on cogent material which should be available on record so material should be available on record. It is not allowed for either of parties. It is not allowed for either of parties. Assessing or the revenue to invoke the jurisdiction under section 260 capital A merely because the tribunal comes to reverse or modify finding given by the lower authorities. Then they say transfer pricing in an expert wing, officers and DRP are dealing with it. So therefore, there is a good application of mind. The problem comes with Next finding, the pick of comparables, shortlisting of them, applying filters are all fact finding exercise. Therefore, the final orders passed by the tribunal are binding on the lower authorities of the department as well as high court and do not give rise to substantial question of law. Binding on the department was okay. What does high, so, so high court says? The finding of fact of the tribunal is also binding on the high court. How can a finding be binding on tribunal? If the associate demonstrate perversity, okay. When you demonstrate perversity, okay. If they are not demonstrating, it is a final finding. But to say that it is always binding would have been a wrong principle, which the High Court had laid, laid, down, uh, laid down. So the pick of comparables, shortlisting of them, applying of filters, the High Court held all of these are factual exercises, and they do not lay down, they do not open the door, and the High Court need not deal with it. The, before the High Court, it was also argued that look, there are few important principles. If they are discussed and guidelines is laid down on filters, comparables, most appropriate method, most of the TP issues can be resolved. The High Court said we will not deal with those uh, laying down of guidelines and these are no substantial question of law, it is only a factual exercise. The problem came with fourth bullet. There were cases before the High Court where tribunal view was inconsistent on the same aspect inconsistent view but they said even inconsistent view does not give rise to substantial question of law so one of the matters in one case the tribunal allowed the capacity adjustment in other matter it did not allow the capacity adjustment both the matters were argued together but the, still the high court said that there is no substantial question of law so they said that and then they said the quantum international trade transactions depends on fair and quick judicial dispensation and therefore there is, they, they, these matters need to be resolved earlier and they do not give rise to substantial question of law. If it is interpretation of DTAA, if it is interpretation treaty shopping, if it is webs, in those cases the substantial question of law will arise and therefore there is no substantial question of law in the transparency matters. Then the matter went to Supreme Court. Now, this is what the Supreme Court held and this is very relevant for all the transparency litigation because now the Supreme Court, based on the Supreme Court's decision, most of these matters will again come before the High Court. So the quantum of litigation that will be before the High Court will be higher. One. Second, department will naturally file all TP appeals from tribunal to the High Court. So it is very necessary for us to understand what the Supreme Court has said 
and ensure that the litigation with respect to transfer pricing, with respect to uh, international taxation, transfer pricing especially, are properly dealt with at the DRP level and at the tribunal level to bring out the relevant aspects. Now, what Supreme Court said? The Supreme Court said the short question before it is whether the tribunal, when the tribunal determines arms length price, the same shall attain finality and the High Court is speculated from considering the determination of arms length price determined by the tribunal in exercise of powers under 260E of the Act. So when the tribunal has decided the matter, whether the High Court can entertain such appeals or whether it cannot entertain the appeal. That was the main issue before the High Court. The High Court in soft branch had held that it cannot entertain the appeal in any context. Whatever is, if it was a TP, it was cannot be entertained. And what in fact had happened was, after deciding soft brands, they applied soft brand in 500, 600 cases and dismissed all the appeals. Whether it was revenue appeal or associate appeal did not matter. Whenever they heard the name of transfer pricing, they said soft brands and appeal was dismissed. In fact, I did not have to open my mouth for various cases. I used to just go there and stand and appeal used to get dismissed and I used to get fees. So this was the way the soft brand was applied and this is what has been reversed by the Supreme Court. Any determination of arm's length price, what Supreme Court now says, any determination of arm's length price which do not follow transfer pricing provisions and guidelines can be considered as perverse and it may be considered a substantial question of law as perversity itself can be said to be a substantial question of law. So what it says is, if the associate or revenue demonstrate that the finding given by the tribunal is not in accordance with the transfer pricing provisions, not in accordance with rule 10b, 10c, section 92c, not in accordance with those provisions, then it can be said that the finding is purpose. So the revenue will have to demonstrate that finding is not in accordance with the provision. If the assessee wants his appeal to be admitted, it has to be demonstrated that it is not been purpose. There cannot be absolute proposition with respect to the tribunal's argument, the High Court's argument that no TP appeal can be admitted. The Supreme Court said no, the TP appeals can be admitted and in the last bullet here, it is always open to the High Court to examine each case. It has to examine each case. Unlike soft brands which did not examine each case, applied a blanket rule and dismissed all TP appeals saying that there is no substantial question of law, the Supreme Court held that each case has to be determined while determining the arms length price, the guidelines laid down under the act and rules are followed. So whether the guidelines laid down under the act or rules are followed or not and whether the determination of arms length price and the findings recorded by the tribunal determined are perverse or not. So decide whether the TP provisions are followed, decide whether the provisions 92C, 10B, 10C are followed or not <coughs> and that followed is based on a particular documents on record and based on that record, please come to a conclusion whether the finding is perverse or not. If the finding is not perverse, if the finding is not perverse, in those cases, substantial question of law cannot be admitted. In other cases, the substantial question of law will be admitted. So they said the finding with respect to two companies, selection of filters, all these are substantial question of law which can be admitted if the if the matters requires consideration. So what principles emanate from this particular decision is, if the computation of arms length price, the tribunal's decision is not as per TP provisions and one demonstrates that, then it can be, finding can be perverse and substantial question of law can be admitted. Second, if their factual finding is perverse based on material or report, then substantial question of law can be admitted. Third, in each case this will have to be demonstrated. It cannot be a blanket thing that it will be done. It will be done and that it has to be admitted blindly. No, it has to be demonstrated that there is a perversity or the provision of law has not been followed. Subsequently, there are two more interesting decisions. One is travel ports decision and one is e value sir. Now, travel ports decision deals with the P attribution and uh, uh, concept of P attribution. Now, in travel ports decision, the associate was a travel agent of a foreign, uh, the associate, sorry, the associate was a CRS, Computer Reservation Service, was providing a computer reservation services. It was a foreign company. It had agents in India. Now, these agents booked airline ticket. So, roughly it was getting $3 from airlines for booking these tickets. 
and it was passing on one dollar to the agents in India. So these agents in India were accounting one dollar offering tax bills. These agents were Indian agents who were having operations in India. But naturally, travel port had a sort of a control what software to use, what things to be done on these agents. It was held that the agents in India created DIP, dependent agent, permanent establishment of travel port. So they are dependent agent of travel port in India. The next question was, yes, they are dependent agent. What is the attribution to this dependent agent? The tribunals had held that the attribution of $1. See, if they got $3, they gave $1. They actually have given roughly 33 to 40%, 50% to the agent's pack. So the, the tribunals gave a conclusion that this amount which is given to agent is sufficient. It is attribution is sufficient. And once the agent is remunerated at arm's length, no further attribution is to be done to the principal. This is the Supreme Court what has laid down in Morgan Stanley. That what principal was followed by the tribunal. And tri tribunal held that once the agent is remunerated at arm's length, no further attribution need to be done to the principal. No further attribution needs to be done to the principal. On that basis, it was concluded that no further attribution is to be done in the hands of travel court team. The appeal to the high court was dismissed saying that there is no substantial question of law. Now it came to the aspect, it came to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court also concluded that the proportion of profits that is attributable in India is a question of fact. It is not a question of law. So what is in attribution exercise? Attribution exercise is basically a mathematical calculation. Then that exercise is a question of fact. It is not a question of law. And in such cases, where it is properly dealt with, there is no further substantial question of law that arises and those appeals need not come to the Supreme Court or High Court. So therefore they dismiss this. So contrast this with the SAP Labs decision. SAP Labs lays down clear principles. This decision is post SAP Labs. SAP Labs laid down the principles that <coughs> actually TP is also ultimately a computation exercise except some charging provisions otherwise majorly it is a computation exercise. So, computation of what should be profit, what should be arms length price, Wallabi attribution of what should be attributed to India are very similar principles, are very similar principles. So, when there is no perversity in that computation, this subsequent travel court's in decisions can help to argue that there is no substantial question of law. Naturally, the SAP Labs decision is valid to the extent that if the assessor is able to demonstrate that the provision is not followed, that extent, yes. If the facts are not considered and facts are perversely considered, in those cases the substantial question of law will be admitted. But where this principle can be demonstrated that attribution principle has come out in travel court's decision, there will still be a room to argue that the TP cases substantial question of law does not arise. Same is the case of e-value sir. There was a case where they had to discuss the exclusion of four comparables. The tribunal had given that these four comparables, the SSC was engaged in the business of rendering IT enabled services and in the context of rendering IT enabled services, they had excluded four comparables, saying that these are not into IT enabled services, we are excluding these four comparables. The finding was given by the tribunal based on earlier tribunal decision and based on certain high court decisions of the same similar assessments. When it went to High Court, High Court said, look, tribunal's finding is correct. Revenue is not able to point out that tri tribunal's finding is wrong or purpose. So ultimately, revenue, based on the data and record available with them, has to point out that how the tribunal's finding is incorrect and which they have not done. And when they have not done that, in that context, the High Court dismissed the revenue's appeal and the matter went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said that High Court held that tribunal gave cogent reasons and disclosed functional reasons to elucidate dissimilarity between four entities and SSE. Therefore, exclusion of four comparables by tribunal for determining ALP of the SSE was upheld. So, there is still, if you reconcile all three decisions, the question that we will have to answer in future when these tribunal appeals are going to Supreme High Court is whether the tribunal findings is based on cogent material whether there is sufficient material on record for inclusion or exclusion of comparable, for selection of PLI or whatever it could be. See, there are various issues that arise in the context of transfer pricing. Some issues are natural legal issues, whether TP is applicable, section 92, income arising from international transaction, whether TP itself is applicable. That will be a question of law always. You can't say that is a 
question of fact. For example, whether if you take like the legal issues that arise is today, exempt income versus TP. So if you have an exempt income, section 47 transfer which is not taxable, the courts have held that it is exempt income, how can you apply TP? Tanesh tax versus transfer price. So if income is presumed and deemed taxable as per the tenage tax scheme, then transfer pricing provisions on that cannot be applied to recalculate the figures. Because it's already saying that this is how it is. For example, if I'm a 44 AD, etc., there's a formula laid down that this is the taxable income. What further TP you will apply to that? Right? So when these kind of deeming fictions are there, the interplay between this, this can be a legal question. That, that, that is not a factual exercise. Similarly, whether the A relationship is there, whether there is an international transaction, these can always create a situation where there is a legal question or substantial question of law arises. But when it comes to other aspects, various other aspects, like what is comparable, what is a filter that should be adopted. Suppose I should apply a turnover filter, I should apply an RPT filter, I should apply an export filter. Whether these filters, these are mixed question of law and vis-a-vis and, and vis the mixed question of law and facts. So in these cases, if the decision of tribunal is based on cogent reasons, then there will be a situation where one could still argue before the high court there is no substantial question of law. And this should be, and unless the department demonstrates that the finding of the tribunal is perverse, finding of the tribunal is perverse, in those cases only the, the, the appeal should be admitted, other cases appeal should not be admitted. So various such issues will arise, various such issues will arise because <coughs> the SAP Labs entire batch comes back to High Court and High Court has to re-hear those matters, roughly 140 cases before the High Court. So principles will have to be determined on those cases. But what we can draw from these three decisions is, how will our documentation be before the authorities? The, the reason for inclusion and exclusion, that material or reason for selection of a filter, the basis for selection of a profit level indicator, what is that reasoning? That should be clearly be available before the tribunal. Many times tribunal may not give proper reasons, but if your paper book, your note is there before the tribunal, before the high court it is always possible to argue that look tribunal decided based on cogent materials and there is no perversity in the finding of the tribunal and that finding is correct unless revenue dis demonstrates that that finding is incorrect. So the whole point that will become more important post these decisions is what is, how good is the information and documents which is before the TPO, before the DRP, before the tribunal in terms of inclusion exclusion of comparables, in terms of applying the filters, in terms of applying a PLI because all of these are linked. Suppose today I talk of applying a particular uh, filter Ultimately, this is all linked to Rule 10.1b because you say that if I say that turnover filter has to be applied, then it is linked to the whether it is a comparable. They say that differences in the enterprise is a reason for rejection of a comparable. Similarly, for RPT, 92F would say that comparable should be uncontrolled transaction. So, if there is a higher RPT, this is linked to the provisions. So, there is some linkage between what we argue and what are there. Uh, in the rules and act, that linkage should be established before the lower authorities that this is on the basis of this rule, this is on the basis of this provision that is very important going forward. But many a times, TP being a factual exercise, business and commercial considerations will be there. Those are, has to be demonstrated and those are factual, again factual in nature. How you demonstrate that? Because everything is not said in act and rules. We many times rely on OECD, we rely on business circumstances. The point would be what good material is there before the authorities and how it is articulated before the tribunal and what revenue can say that that evidence is relevant or irrelevant. That would be the point of argument when these matters travel to the high court. When these matters travel to the high court. So these are some aspects on the these decisions. Naturally, this decision again uh, to a great extent will increase, in, increase the TP litigation because now each and every case has to be tested before the Supreme, before the High Court and Supreme Court. Every TP case will have to be tested before the High Court and Supreme Court. Last decision we will deal is the Abhisar Bhagavad. This particular
particular decision again deals with the search matters and has will have very relevant consideration in the post amendment era also what happens is as i said first the provisos second proviso to 153a said that all pending assessments will abate so if on the date of initiation of search pending assessments abate but there could be assessments which are completed so there could be assessments which are pending either 143.3 there could be assessments which are pending under 147 so those both will naturally become pending assessments which will be abated there could be assessments which are completed and in the context of completed assessments the earlier 153a provided that once 153a search is done the notice for 6 years can be issued the argument that assessees were making is that in case of completed assessment if no incriminating material is found during the course of a search then those assessments cannot be reopened under 153a that was a simple argument that you have done a search for say assessment year 1 you have found no material and it is also completed do not open it if it is pending assessment assessment abates and it is completely open before the assessing officer to do an assessment of incriminate based on incriminating material best any other information that is available before the assessing officer during the course of a search but when it is pending assessment what is happening is <coughs> there is no incriminating material if they reopen under 153a they will do new inquiries and found new issues and make an addition for new issue which is not emerging out of search so he is going to ask me new questions and based on those new questions new information is collected and an addition is made based on those additions those system the leading case kabul chawla's case delhi high court said if no incriminating material is found then no additions can be made if no incriminating material is found no additions can be made so this was the principle laid down kabul chawla various high courts have followed including karnataka high court the matter has traveled to the supreme court so in the context of 153a this the supreme court has laid down certain principles what is this laid down is that in case of a completed unabated assessments completed or unabated assessments so unabated could also be where only 143 one is done and earlier no notice has been issued so no assessment was done and also no incriminating material has found the revenue has no jurisdiction under section 153a in the absence of any incriminating material found during the search under section 132 or requisition under 132a so if no material is found for completed assessment or unabated assessment then no jurisdiction lies under 153a no notice can be issued under 153 capital a the reason for this is the very purpose of search which is a prerequisite very purpose of search which is a prerequisite trigger for invoking provisions of section 153a or 153c is detection of undisclosed income by undertaking extraordinary power of search and seizure the income which cannot be detected in the ordinary course in the regular assessment thus the foundation of making assessment can be said to be existence of incriminating material showing undisclosed income detected as a result of a search so the genesis of 153a and 153c is search and incriminating material found during the course of a search and if that incriminating material is not found during the course of a search then there is no need to reopen this cases so sc interpret second proviso to 150 holds that it abates only pending assessments revenue can exercise jurisdiction only with respect to pending assessment so the pending assessment which abates for that full jurisdiction including incriminating material or any other material which come to the notice of the revenue during the course of the assessment proceedings all of that would be open before the assessing officer all of that would be open before the assessing officers with respect to unabated assessments with respect to assessments which are completed and no new material the twin condition is completed unabated assessments or unabated assessments plus no incriminating material found completely barred so they are completely barred however before closing the supreme court says the revenue cannot be remediless and therefore in a fit case they can issue 147 148 for those cases if the fulfillment of conditions conditions contain there <coughs> so while they said assessments are invalid in all these cases they said that in these cases if 147 or 148 can be done then the assess, assessing officer could do it very weird situation because first 
these all years are pretty old years. It has travelled to Supreme Court means there are already 10, 15 years old matters. We all know how much time it takes from assessing officer to Supreme Court. Because the initial three de two decisions we discussed all were 20, 30 years old. So if these are 10, 12 years old, 147 jurisdiction is very unlikely that it will pass a 3 years test or a 10 years test also. So there is no way that 147, 148 can be issued. Second, if now 147, 148 has to be issued, then the new provision of 148 capital A has to be followed. A notice has to be issued in 148 capital B saying that this is the material available, reply has to be taken in 148AD order has to be passed and 148 notice has to be issued. Very unlikely that that is also possible in such circumstances. What revenue did is they filed a miscellaneous petition seeking clarification on this 147. They argued that the aspect of time limit assessee should not be allowed to argue in this particular case. So when I open review 147, assessee should not argue about the time limitation at all. Luckily, the Supreme Court said that the matter raised in the miscellaneous petition cannot be raised in the miscellaneous petition because miscellaneous petition is only for rectifying apparent errors and you file a review petition which will be heard in the open court. The judge who passed this order has retired. So luckily, I mean earlier some orders were also passed by him. So luckily, the Supreme Court therefore did not say that the time limit aspect, if you remember that Ashish Agarwal's case in the context of 148, they says all notices, <coughs> saving revenues 90,000 notices and these all will be notices deemed under 148A and SSC can proceed based on that. So that was not done and they said you file a proper review petition and someone will hear those review petition in open court and see it. So till that review petition is heard, as of now this is what is the law. So those assessments which were not pending, which were completed and which were unabated assessments and no incriminating material for, those becomes invalid. Whether they can issue a 147, very difficult proposition, very difficult proposition. <coughs> this also helps in the new provisions. If you see the new provisions, again, one for, so now the search assessments also will be done under 147, Red Brick 148 and 148 capital A. Now under 148 capital A, if I have to go for a time limit for more than 3 years, luckily the as a provision is very clear, the escapement of income has to be 50 lakh for each of the assessment years. So if you do a search today and you want to go up to 10 years under the new law, that is 3 years to 10 years, so the two, two blocks, 1 year to 3 years and 3 years to 10 years, 4 year to 10 years. So one, welcome to 1 year to 3 year later. But when it comes to 4 year to 10 years, if they have to today say that I want to reassess these cases, then the income escaping assessment, income chargeable to tax which is escaped assessment should be more than 50 lakh rupees for each of the assessment years. So when you do a search, it is not that the entire bracket of 10 years can be reopened, especially in the block of 4 to 10 years, <coughs> the test of 50 lakh for each of the years has to be found. So when you do a search now, <coughs> for year 7 or year 8, <coughs> it is found that the escapement is 5 lakh, 10 lakh, they will not be able to reopen under the new provision. For each of the years, it has to be more than 50 lakh rupees. So there has to be incriminating material found to say that it is more than 50 lakh for each of the assessment years. Then comes the block of 1 to 3 years. Now what would happen is if a search is done and out of 3 years only incriminating material is for say year 2 and there is no material for year 3 and year 1. Can I apply this Abhishar Bildwell's case and say that look there is no incriminating material you cannot issue 147 for year 3 and year 1 or you can issue only for 2. That would be a grey area for argument because the current language of section says that once a search is done, the notice can be issued for 3 assessment years, year 1, year 2, year 3, 4 year onwards the 50 lakh test would be kicking in. But for the first 3 years, the 50 lakh test would not be applicable, it is open assessment. But possibly to argue based on this, that if no incriminating material is found, then where is the question of satisfying the test of information? The way they have done is, the search itself is a valid information for us to, the separate subsection has been inserted and that itself is a valid reason for them to refund 1 to 3 years. But naturally these arguments will be taken in future saying that look at Abhisar's case, if no incriminating material, why even reopen for 3 years, there is no ground, don't do anything of that. But that will be matter which will be debated. 
But this one good decision which settles the dust that if there is no incriminating material, at least 153A for all years cannot be done. The earlier view that once the search is done, six year is automatic reopening, at least is not valid as per the Supreme Court decision. So with this, I tried to cover some interesting decisions. If there are any questions, we can try and uh, or any views or comments on these decisions, we can try and understand. We have another at least ten minutes. Anyone? Can any? you throw some light on that PF and ESA that what it can be a condition? Ah, so the Supreme Court. Okay, the. Uh, checkmates decision 36158. So, as we all know, this was one burning issue for many years that employee contribution which is collected and paid post the due date has prescribed under the PFA but within the due date of filing return of income. So, under 224, employee contribution collected becomes income. And I get a deduction under 36.15a if I pay it within the due date prescribed under the PFA. Through and through the High Courts had held, including Karnataka High Court in Sabri and other cases, that the deduction will be allowed if the PF employee contribution to PF is paid within the due date of filing return of income, not the due date prescribed under the PFA. Checkmate's decision reverses that entire stand. On the logic that this is not assessee's income, assessee is holding this money in trust. And when it is holding in trust, it should strictly follow the provisions of a statute. Even one day's delay today results in disallowance of entire expenditure. Now, this is how the strict interpretation of the provision happen, is happening. And this is how the Supreme Court has said that even a single day's delay can result in a disallowance of expenditure. The another problem is it is a permanent disallowance, not like other 43 bit disallowances where I don't get in one year, I will at least get in subsequent years. So, various employer contribution or other contributions or even interest in other things, I will subsequently get it. 48 disallowance for non deduction of TDS. At least in the year in which I get a deduction, I will pay the TDS and get it. This becomes a permanent dis disallowance. So, but very, very strict interpretation has been given. Ultimately, when the associate makes this payment, he has given the money, though he held in trust, he has given the money, he has expended the money, nothing remains in his pocket. But anyway, the Supreme Court said that if it is not within the provisions of a statute, then it will be, it has to be disallowed. Various issues are arising out of this particular decision. One, tribunal has held that PF is allowable. Tribunal had consistently held that PF paid within the due date is allowable. What happens to that? 1. 143.1. CPC saw the audit report, saw the uh, that particular schedule, tax audit report, matched it and disallowed and passed the intimations. In those cases, the matters are before CA appeals or criminal. There could two grounds could have been taken by whether 143.1 can cover these kind of disallowances. Second, I have any otherwise deduction is available. Second one was very easy because the High Court said that it is deductible. Third, the matters may be pending in the assessments. That becomes very easy because now the Supreme Court's decision, any Supreme Court decision is always retrospective unless specifically stated to be prospective. Like some decisions, they have said it is prospective. Like recent Nobles case, they have said it is prospective. So when it is retrospective, when it is retrospective, it applies all to pending assessments. What would happen to these cases? The cases which are in assessment or which are pending assessments, those cases have no choice at all. They will have to be disallowed. Because Supreme Court decision is there unless by a policy legislative amendment something is provided, it will be disallowed. Cases which are before pending appeals will naturally follow the Supreme Court decision. Third situation where tribunal has passed the order or CA appeals has passed the order. And the matters are the order giving effect to those tribunal orders and CA tables has to be given. So, suppose in 143.3 a disallowance has been made and you have gone to tribunal, tribunal said that this has to be disallowed, this has to be sorry, tribunal held that this has to be allowed. 
But the AO has to pass an order giving effect to that terminal order and give a conclusion and give the refund back or whatever is reduce the demand in the system. Naturally, they are not doing that. They are filing miscellaneous petition in all these cases before the tribunal. Now, in miscellaneous petitions also, a couple of things are happening. One, miscellaneous petition is within six months of 254 2 would say the miscellaneous petition, that means the rectification of order, if there is any mistake apparent from record, should be done within six months from the date of the order. Now, six months from the date of the order, if miscellaneous petition is filed and order is passed within six months, can a subsequent Supreme Court decision by mistake operate from record? This is also settled principle that a subsequent Supreme Court decision is a mistake operate from record, can be rectified both under 154 and can be rectified under 254. So there is also settled principle, I think, if I remember that, I am that spinning mills case. They said subsequent Supreme Court decision is a mistake operate from record and can be resolved under 154, can be resolved under 254 also. So if it is within that bracket of 154 or 254 that can be done. The issue that arises is cases where department is filing miscellaneous petition beyond 6 months. Tribunal order passed say in last May and they file miscellaneous petition today. It is beyond 6 months the time limit given on 254. <coughs> in those cases what will happen? I think in those cases the miscellaneous petition is not maintainable that because the miscellaneous petition is not maintainable because which is beyond 6 months, the statutory limitation period which is given. So those cases where which are coming before, after 6 months from the date of order, where the miscellaneous petition for rectification of tribunal order are filed before the tribunal beyond 6 months from the date of the order, the argument will have to be taken that this is beyond 6 months. Therefore, miscellaneous petition is invalid. Therefore, miscellaneous petition is invalid and the miscellaneous petition should be dismissed. That having said, post that what happens? Post that what happens? You go back to the assessing officer, look there is a tribunal order, your miscellaneous petition is dismissed. Your miscellaneous petition is dismissed. So therefore pass an order giving effect to the tribunal order, giving me deduction of the PF. This is the statement that we are going to make before the assessing officer. That miscellaneous petition is dismissed, tribunal said that you give me deduction, that order is still valid order that is still surviving order and therefore please give me deduction for this PM deductions. Suppose he passes that order giving you deduction. Say that you have paid within the due date of filing written order, tribunal order is passed. One, practically he will not pass this order. Then it will be very difficult to say that you need to pass the order. Assuming he passes the order. After passing that order can he rectify again? Is there no mistake apparent from record? The Supreme Court decision is before the order now, not after the order. Today he passes the order, give order giving effect to, post the tribunal's order, today if he passes an order giving effect to, he has not complied with the Supreme Court decision. Not complying with the Supreme Court decision, is it a mistake of print from record? It is in compliance with the tribunal order to that extent. That will be a matter of debate. That will be a matter of debate. In my personal opinion, when he passes an order, order being effective, there is a tribunal order, there is a Supreme Court order. Not following a Supreme Court order, the decisions in the context of 254.2 and 154 say, if an order is passed under 154, which is contrary to the provision of a law, that means you have not followed a particular statutory provision, or not followed a Supreme Court decision, there is a possibility that he will do a 154 for that. After passing an order being effective, he could still do it. I would feel that he could still do it because not following a Supreme Court order itself is a mistake apparent from record. But in the order giving effect, he is only complying with the directions. Direction. So it is not that he is applying this, might be. There is yes. no scope for him to commit an error in that order. It is just plain application of what ITAC is directed. He is yes. following the direction and there is no That is a valid argument. That is a very valid argument. We have to, that is how we have to do it. But getting the officer to do this, especially when the quantums are small, it is going to be difficult. The quantum are large, with petition to high court will be an option. Yeah. Policy amendment is a legislative amendment clarifying these aspects uh, or it is laying down some guidelines for this would have been much better. But the decision of Supreme Court creates a lot of issues.
So uh, I think cover the complete the uh, presentation with this. Hope there is a good value addition with this. At least for me, there is a good value addition reading these decisions. Thank you one and all for patient care. Important landmark cases, case laws in favor of assessees. This sentence itself will uh, bring a smile on each and every member present here, especially chartered accountants and advocates, because very less of us uh, represent the income tax department, right? It was a detailed analysis of uh, case laws with facts and inference of law by C. A. Narendra Kumar Jain sir. A round of applause for that wonderful session. Thank you for your time and effort, expertise and experience, sir. On behalf of members present here and chairperson and managing committee members of Bangalore branch of SAI, we thank you for uh, taking the time out in your busy schedule for all of us. As a token of uh, gratitude and respect on behalf of uh, members present here and the chairperson and uh, managing committee members of Bangalore branch, I request uh, the DBIS chairperson to come out of the and then and our amendment too. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Uh, we wholeheartedly thank each one member here who have made it on this pleasant Saturday morning for your support. Keep supporting Bangalore Branch for all the future programs. Uh, with that, we come to an end of the session. Uh, uh, now, uh, I see Manjula Temmalur, the Secretary of Bangalore Branch, sign up for the day. Thank you. Have a good day.